Okay, technique is everything, so uh, we <laughs> better be absolutely sure how this is going to, uh, uh, the best way of doing this. Okay, um, we've, uh, uh, we've looked at this slide before, so we can treat pretty well anything we like. We've said uh, we can treat pretty well any patient we uh, like, but with some cautions about rather um, infirm and immobile patients. Uh, Gareth has just told us what we need to do it, so there's a, a, a shopping list for you. Uh, my clinic room is not dissimilar to yours. Um, in fact, uh, I do all my treatments in my consulting room uh, these days. And uh, most of the consulting rooms, thanks to CQC, don't have carpets uh, on them. Uh, in fact, most of my consulting rooms don't even have a fan to keep us cool in the summer, thanks to the CQC. Uh, we do warn the patients about some, uh, a number of factors when we're obtaining their consent. And in fact, uh, I have, uh, as Andrew does, pre-printed uh, sheets which uh, go into some details about the treatment, what happens, uh, what the likely adverse events are going to be. So serious and frequently occurring uh, adverse events are mentioned in that. Um, and we certainly mention visual disturbance and chest problems, which we see from time to time. Um, we also mention things which we see often, which are the leg is a little bit lumpy and bumpy and bruised afterwards with some pigmentation over the vein. And in a few people, thrombophobitis. Uh, we also mention that deep vein thrombosis uh, may occur and uh, uh, we do give uh, prophylactic anticoagulants where appropriate. Um, however, I don't pay, tell patients they may suffer a heart attack, a stroke or death afterwards because I think that would be unnecessarily raising anxieties amongst my patients. We were saying that uh, foam sclerotherapy works well in the hands of experts, but not all experts. Um, and uh, not all experts are equal. And there are a couple of papers where, which make this um, uh, apparent one of the ones is the, one, uh, the study that Andrew and I participated in where surgeons uh, uh, treated patients with foam and phlebologists who are used to doing sclerotherapy treated patients with foam and the surgeons had 68% on duplex ultrasound at a year and phlebologists 94% success. Uh, so technique is um, everything. Okay, to try and understand uh, what we are uh, setting out to do when we treat a patient with uh, varicose veins. Here I've drawn the, or at least I've borrowed a drawing of the saphenous vein and coloured in uh, the veins that might be varicose veins or they might be potential varicose veins. So the saphenous trunk is incompetent and all red veins are uh, incompetent. So all the tributaries and accessory veins there seem to be incompetent. So you can ablate the saphenous trunk using radiofrequency uh, ablation um, or laser ablation and that gets rid of the saphenous trunk and then you can do some phlebectomies or, um, and take out the obvious varices. Uh, but as you will see, unless you are very systematic about it, you're going to leave behind some of these red things which don't show up initially um, but are potentially the source of more varicose veins. So what we do with them um, uh, our method of foam sclerotherapy is to inject foam along the saphenous trunk, which will treat the saphenous trunk very nicely, and it also injects all uh, significant varicose veins and their tributaries of the saphenous trunk and accessory veins, and that will give you this picture where everything that is now or might ever become a varicose vein has been obliterated. And it is not that different. All my appointments for my patients are 30 minutes, so that can be accomplished in 30 minutes in, uh, in most patients. So what we do is canalate all the saphenous trunks and the major varices, do direct needle injections into the uh, saphenous varices, but um, avoid uh, massively exceeding the uh, maximum, uh, at least the amount of foam on the summary of product characteristics, which is 16 mils. In fact, I commonly put in up to 20 mils of foam, but uh, the SBC is there for your interpretation and not um, slavish adherence. Uh, and then we have to do something appropriately post-operatively. Um, ultrasound imaging is um, essential in order to assess the patient and know what we're going to be treating before we start, where all the incompetent saphenous trunks lie, where the accessory veins are, where the perforating veins are. Uh, the perforating veins that give rise to varices that I commonly treat are the thigh, thigh perforating vein, medial thigh perforating veins, lateral popliteal fossa perforating veins, and paratibial uh, perforating veins. The 
uh, ankle perforators are often um, re-entry perforators, and we don't systematically treat those in people with varicose veins. Uh, however, in people with C4, 5, and 6 disease, in other words, skin changes, uh, healed or open leg ulcers, I am um, pretty assiduous in destroying every single perforating vein I can in the leg. Uh, and that seems to lead to leg ulcer healing. Deep vein uh, thrombosis risk assessment I mentioned before for those people at high risk of uh, deep vein thrombosis. So people with, who are very elderly um, with uh, large varicose veins, very large varicose veins or skin changes, I would give them rivaroxaban for, or dabigatran for 10 to 14 days. One dose on the day of treatment has no known effect and is not on the summary product characteristics for either of those drugs. Uh, probably most of you are pretty good at putting a needle in a vein under ultrasound guidance, but if you're not, practice is needed, and an ultrasound phantom such as this is quite a good way of getting some practice before you begin. Uh, this picture was taken a decade uh, ago and uh, shows what we do. Put a little bit of local anaesthetic in the skin, put the needle through the anaesthetised bit, and then put it in the vein. And then we put some saline in to confirm the, uh, that we've got a good cannulation. If you do that, you can be 100% sure you're in the vein and not outside the vein. You're in the vein and not in the uh, artery. Horrible things happen if you inject foam into a big artery. Make some tasari foam and put that in. Uh, check that um, the foam is in the right place while you're doing it, preferably, if you haven't done very much of this before and wrap the leg in a bandage. And here we're applying some eccentric compression with uh, some bell band. And that's a reasonably effective way of applying compression. Stocking is good for holding the whole thing uh, in place and, uh, and, and making sure that the compression regime is acceptable for the patient. Um, where do you put the cannulas? Well, these days, this is uh, what I would do in the great saphenous vein. I'd normally put two in the great saphenous vein above the knee, two below the knee and then either do direct needle injections into any major accessory veins um, under ultrasound guidance or put butterflies or small cannulas into the uh, major superficial uh, varices. Uh, in the small saphenous vein we put uh, a cannula more proximally and another one uh, more distally and that will effectively treat the entire length of that vein. If somebody's got an anterior accessory saphenous vein, so this thing is the anterior accessory saphenous vein, uh, put a cannula inside the fascial compartment. Uh, this is the great saphenous vein lying immediately to it. Um, I usually treat that as well in people with anterior accessory saphenous vein incompetence because usually um, these varices actually join up to the great saphenous vein as well. And then we also do additional injections into the varices filled by the incompetent anterior accessory saphenous vein. So that's what we do. Uh, the videos don't seem to work perfectly on this, so we can look at um, this uh, patient that we prepared earlier. Um, so the first bit starts out with um, ultrasound uh, assessment of the distribution of veins, and this was a patient that Gareth found for me for making this particular video. And as you will have seen, the saphenous vein there is about three millimetres or four millimetres in diameter, thus maximising the difficulty of uh, cannulating it. Um, so we put uh, anaesthetise the skin. Um, don't normally need to anaesthetise the vein up at this end of the leg, though I commonly do near the uh, ankle. The ankle saphenous vein has got nerves around it. The patient's absolutely delighted with the treatment already, as you can see. Uh, need to make sure that the cannula is in the right place, and uh, um, we normally image the vein whilst um, putting in some saline. So there's the second of the cannulas in the great saphenous vein uh, above the knee. And we're going to carry on down the leg. Uh, when we're doing the presentation, the uh, demonstrations this afternoon, we can talk a little bit about exactly where uh, I think the best place is to put the uh, cannulas. Um, so here I'm verifying the position of the, uh, uh, of the cannula uh, into the incredibly small saphenous trunk in this patient. We've also put some cannulas in the small saphenous vein. So I put six cannulas in this uh, patient's leg and uh, we didn't actually do any direct needle injection of varices uh, here. We've elevated the leg, that's a homage to George Fegan, but also ensures that the veins are as empty as possible. Uh, you can flush the saphenous vein with saline before you start. The Australians quite like doing that, and I do that quite a lot. 
and then you watch the foam going uh, down the vein. And uh, we inject uh, rather modest amounts in the calf, perhaps up to four mils of foam in the saphenous vein, uh, great saphenous vein uh, below the knee, somewhere between four and eight mils into the saphenous vein uh, above the knee. But I probably only put about four mils of foam into this rather small uh, great saphenous vein above, um, above the knee. So that's um, all we need to do. And then uh, the next phase is to uh, um, treat anything else. Um, we sometimes retreat veins. If the vein is rather large, injecting one uh, adequate of foam is uh, pretty effective, uh, but we can improve the efficacy by putting in a second shot into the same cannula, which is a, another advantage of uh, putting intravenous cannulas in. So the cannulas, make sure you're in the right place. You can monitor the uh, flow of foam quite easily. Um, you can see whether um, you've filled the entire vein. And uh, I think it's a, a, both a safety and an efficacy uh, technique, um, a technique that ensures we maximize the benefit of every, every part of this treatment. And then you stand back and let your friends bandage up the rest of the legs. <laughs> most difficult part of the entire operation. In fact. Um, compression, nobody knows how long we should bandage the leg for. We normally bandage it for about a week. I, I bandage my patients for about one week. Um, afterwards, we used to, when we did this in 2001, um, we were putting on elastic stockings only and no compression bandaging, and the patients got a lot of big lumps and phlebitis. Uh, so then we bandage the leg with peer half to this uh, short stretch bandage and uh, that moderates the problems afterwards. Uh, as George Fegan said, I think um, it's, it, he would like to have compression on for six weeks and I think that would uh, get rid of most of uh, uh, the thrombophlebitis we have but it might also get rid of most of our patients so mm -hmm. we have to compromise. So as you see the patient's sort of uh, very happy about um, <laughs> the outcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it improves your relationship. So uh, we normally do um, uh, bandaging for a week and then I normally advise my patients to wear their compression stocking when they're out of bed for another seven days after that, uh, which I think uh, makes the, uh, any tenderness or inflammation that surrounds the uh, saphenous vein much more comfortable to um, accommodate in these people. Um, I always look at my patients two to three weeks later to check, uh, check how effective the treatment is. If we've totally failed, which is extremely uncommon in actual fact, then we can completely redo the treatment. More commonly, we're looking for a few leftover varices and uh, uh, residual tributaries of the vein and doing direct needle injections under ultrasound guidance. Um, for those, um, quite often there's an excess of thrombus, in, particularly in large varices or in large saphenous trunks. So we can remove that um, and uh, we can reapply further compression if we've done some more sclerotherapy. So this is how we get the uh, thrombus out. This video does work. Um, this patient's had uh, foam sclerotherapy done uh, a couple of weeks before and has this lumpy thing in the calf, which is not very satisfactory. So we can put in some uh, local anaesthetic again, and it's good to anaesthetize the veins, which are often quite tender at this stage, as well as the skin. So we can put in, and here I'm using a 19 gauge needle, but sometimes uh, we put in a 14 gauge needle if the, um, the thrombus is re reluctant to come out. Steer the needle down the inside of the vein, trying not to touch the sides because the vein can be quite tender on the inside and then we aspirate the thrombus and immediately the patient feels that there's less tenderness in the leg. And uh, I commonly do this to in the saphenous trunk as well as in the superficial varices. You normally get um, about five mils of thrombus or sometimes 10 mils of thrombus out of a saphenous vein. Uh, and then the patient reports that immediately the leg feels much better. So this is a, a very valuable technique, very widely used by phlebologists who do foam sclerotherapy. Uh, once we've completed the treatment, it can wave goodbye to the patient and I always uh, invite my patients to return after six months to check that the treatment works. So a proportion of patients get recanalization and we can do further direct needle injections of foam if necessary to correct any incompetent residual segments or residual varices. And uh, of course, it's always in private practice an upselling opportunity for those patients who still have some thread veins. I can recommend that they see my clinical nurse specialist for sclerotherapy to their to langectuses. 
So in summary, uh, the, uh, the English method that we're describing here is called the English method by my uh, uh, continental colleagues in a rather disparaging sort of way because anything English must be bad if you live on the continent of Europe. Um, and uh, we use multiple Canada's as you've seen. Um, treat absolutely everything in sight because if you leave anything that's going to be a varicose vein uh, in a year or three's time. Um, we like to apply compression as we've seen and then with a, uh, review the outcome and complete it after two to three weeks and a final review at six months. And this will give you the 80 to 90% freedom from varicose veins at five years if you do it my way. Thanks very much.